Housing in particular was a focus of the New Deal policy. The housing industry by 1934 was only one-tenth the size it had been in the 1920s. A huge fraction of all the people on relief were actually construction workers. Now, construction is a very crucial part of the American economy in the 1930s. During the 20s, it and automobiles had really driven the economy. And it's a very special part of the economy because of something called linkages. So that when you build a house, you need nails, you need wood, you need all kinds of things that go into the house. And you also need both unskilled and skilled labor. And so a house really connects and multiplies out. It ripples into the economy around it. And so New Deal policymakers saw that if they could get the housing industry going again, they could get America going again. Now the challenge in all of this was that mortgage markets had collapsed after the, after the crash. They had collapsed because, uh, for many reasons, one of the important reasons was that there was a sudden withdrawal of investment by banks in mortgages. This happened because the kinds of mortgages that people received in the 1920s. Now, Today in America, the standard mortgage is a 30-year fixed mortgage. This is what we think about as a normal mortgage. But in the 1920s, there was a great variety in the kinds of mortgages that one could get for a house. There were short mortgages that were three to five years, balloon mortgages where you only paid the interest. So it was kind of like you were only really renting the house. There were 10-year mortgages that were self-liquidating, so you paid the interest and the principal, and over time, at the end of that 10 years, you could actually own your house. Now, these balloon mortgages made up a huge part of the mortgage market, and at the end of that three to five years, you would have to refinance your house, very similar to balloon mortgages during the recent financial crisis. And like those balloon mortgages of the recent financial crisis, they were funded by bonds. And so these local banks would sell bonds to investors to fund these mortgages. And what would happen was that at the end of the few years, you would expect people to be able to go into the bank and refinance your house. Well, that didn't happen after the crash. People started to stop investing in these bonds. And suddenly, banks couldn't refinance all the mortgages they had given people. And then they went into foreclosure. And suddenly, the very nature of the financial instrument of that balloon mortgage led to the collapse of American housing markets. And so there's a very deep connection, not just between the macro economy and housing, but between the way in which lending happened and the housing crash of the Great Depression. So to stop, to stop the sudden free fall of these markets, there was a program called the Homeowners Loan Corporation that swapped government bonds for these mortgages. And the government took on the risk of owning these mortgages. And it stopped the free fall. But not everyone could get them, and it was not enough to restart the mortgage markets. There was only a way to stop the bleeding out of American home value. So how do you fix this? How do you take something that is so important to getting the economy going again, and at the same time, so dependent on all different kinds of players in the financial system, and at the same time, not spend any government money, right? Because this is too big for the government to take over. The answer is the Federal Housing Administration. Now, what's exciting about the Federal Housing Administration is that it's basically a government-run insurance policy that gets housing going again. So in 1934, the National Housing Act reimagines everything about housing from the ground up, from how you borrow to who invests in the mortgage. So how does it change things? It changes things because instead of you just going out and buying a house and then trying to find a borrower, the government steps in to set up a series of standards about how houses should be built. If they follow these standards, then the mortgage is already pre-approved as long as you can put 20% down, which is actually much less than it had been before then. This mortgage, then offered by a mortgage company or a local bank, is then sold to an intermediary called the Federal National Mortgage Association, 
or as it came to be later called, Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae would then sell this mortgage to an investor, especially an insurance company who had all this money piling up from policies and needed to be invested somewhere. And so in this process, they do a few different things. They say, we're going to make sure there's a good quality of housing that's being built, not speculative housing. We're going to connect these New York insurance companies with faraway lenders so that people in Texas can borrow from people in New York. And perhaps you're thinking, well, why couldn't they do that before? Well, how is a New York investor going to know what kind of house is being built in Texas? Investors don't usually lend money for things they can't see. And this is the genius of the standards. So the FHA creates standards for lending, creates a market for the exchange of investor and borrower, and doesn't actually lend any money itself. So that money can flow from New York around the country and get those houses being built and get those mortgages being made. And in the process, they manage to avoid this problem of refinance. The new FHA mortgages that people received were both cheaper than older mortgages, only 5% interest, and at the same time, they were longer, starting at 15 years and then very quickly 20 and 30 years. These long mortgages meant that there'd be no overlap between the refinance and the business cycle as there had been with the mortgage crisis of the bonds. And so these long-term mortgages, these safe investments, these good houses lead to a boom in housing construction in the US and lead eventually to the rise of suburban housing in America. This entire system is predicated on focusing not on government spending, but on the re-channeling of private capital so that the government is not spending to build these houses. It is simply creating the mechanism by which money can be invested in private hands. And so this process rejuvenates capitalism. And so whether it's in the Rural Electrification Administration, the FHA, or in other programs, there is this other new deal that rechannels capital into investment and brings about resurgent prosperity.